Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is Chapter 2, Part 3, The Activities of Integration. The analysis of the isolated product can be compared with the philosophical analysis of the understanding of first end. The production of isolated objects, which separates these objects and determines aspects and properties of them, contains the principal characteristics of the first end in that it is an intellectual activity which isolates and defines, which works to express the particular significance of objects and strives to become a technique of thought, grammar, technique of analysis, formal logic. The understanding is the function of the distinct, the distinct, the individual, and the instant of the praxis on the scale of the individual or the isolated object of the practical objective. Consideration of the isolated object is only a first step for thought. The fundamental operation of philosophy has always been the reconstruction of the whole. Thinking man has always sensed that the isolated object was inconceivable by itself, and the abstractive activity itself must also be comprehended, that is, linked to the complex of the conditions that determine it and the aims it pursues. He has always sensed, therefore, that the initial datum, that is, the whole, must be recovered by comprehending it or bringing it under the control of the reason. The intuitive or primitive mentality preserves a keen awareness of this whole. Whenever it pictures objects or causal series to itself, it feels the need to reintegrate these products immediately into the totality. Philosophy has always sought to affect the conscious integration of the element into the totality, but in the attempt several forms of sophism become possible. We may look for the principle of integration in man's activity, seen as a mechanical sum of abstract operations, or else as leading to a determinate technique such as formal logic. A philosophy which seeks to reconstitute the whole in this way is doomed to take an abstract view of the activity's special operations at the precise moment when it wants to transcend abstraction and attain the concrete and the totality. This is what happens in classical idealism. We may also try to attain the totality on this side of the abstractive activity by omitting this activity, by returning via the imagination towards a stage previous to the activity, into the domain that is, of muddled intuitions on the level of the primitive mentality. This form of intuitive thinking ignores the data of the problem. Starting from a problem posed by the existence of a, product, of a productive activity of abstraction and by the demand for a higher unity, it quite simply denies this abstractive activity. Such doctrines, intuitionism, primitivism, crude holism, offer an odd mixture of intellectual sophistication and summary anti-intellectualism. Anti the integration has got to be carried out consciously and correctly without leaving any aspect of the problem out of account. The isolated product must be restored to the complex of its relations. The isolation of an object of nature, its logical identity with itself, can only be a limit, a final aim, which our activity can never wholly achieve however hard it tries. An object is isolated or consolidated only in one of its aspects, and only through the mediation of another object itself not wholly iso isolable. The house that gives me shelter, a tree in the garden, a field of corn. In a whole series of other aspects, objects remain immersed in the vast movement of the world. The mind which takes this isolation and consolidation of objects to be an accomplished fact is falling into the error of mechanism. Instead of an integration, it is performing a summation, and a summation of products, moreover, as if these were natural beings, and as if it were possible to recover nature by adding them together. We must move from the isolated product to the, to the sum of products, and simultaneously from consideration, consideration, uh, or consideration of this fragmentary activity to that of the creative activity as a whole. This integration is a fundamental operation both in general philosophy 
and in various specific sciences, in which a change of scale must be effected in order to get from the element to the whole. Political economy thus demands that we move on from the particular commodity to the market, from the viewpoint of the isolated producer to the examination of production and productivity as a whole. This change of viewpoint is the correl correlative of a profound change in the nature of the phenomenon. Confusion between the two scales leads to those errors current amongst economists, who without being aware of it, fetishize the whole by picturing it to themselves as outside and above the elementary phenomena, accepted in their isolation. In sociology and history too, we must pass from the psychological and individual view view viewpoint to that of the social whole. And in the natural sciences, analogous operations might be found, by means of which, thanks to a change of scale, we can move from the elementary phenomenon up to the statistical st statistical result, the global mean. As far as the analysis of human activity is concerned, such an operation is possible only because the whole exists concretely and pre-exists its elements. In one sense, these elements are real, in themselves, as moments of the whole, but in another sense they are simply abstractions in relation to the whole. The social whole is given as a practical organization or praxis. This change of scale corresponds to the philosophical tr transition from the first end understanding to the vernunft reason and gives the order for this transition. Integration is not a speculative fantasy. The unity of the world, which is shattered in one way by the activity of fragmentation, by the production of isolated objects and the consolidation, material or intellectual, of particular causal series, is continued, although specifically, on the human plane. Every activity is a cooperation. Human needs are not absolutely separate from each other, either in time or in space, either in the individual or in the group. One technique gives birth to another, one technique perfects another, etc. Reason is the function of the movement, of the whole, of the total life, and of the transcending. The objective world of man is a world of products forming a whole. What we traditionally refer to as the world of sense perception. This social world is laden with effective or representative meanings, which extend beyond the instant, the separate object, the isolated individual. In this sense, the most trivial objects is the bearer of countless suggestions and relationships. It refers to all sorts of activities, not immediately present in it. For child and adult alike, objects are not merely a momentary material pr presence or the occasion of a subjective activity. They provide us with an objective social content, traditions, technical, social, spiritual, and the most complex qualities are present in the humblest of objects, conferring on, them a conferring on them a symbolic value or style. Each object is the content of consciousness, a moment. When the sum of objects is thought of as a whole, products acquire a higher meaning, which they do not have when they are seen in isolation. Man's activity, examined on the scale of the praxis, receives fresh determinations, that is, a higher form and content. A country is a product of human activity, since it has been fashioned by successive generations. The very face of the earth, the landscape, and the whole of nature, such as it exists for us at this moment, are a product with the two aspects implied in that term, the subjective and the objective. Human consciousness thus appears in its relation to the sum of products. This relation is a profound one, even where an artist is concerned, who creates himself and grasps, grasps himself in his work and in the succession of his artifacts. It becomes more profound still when a historical community is concerned. The activity of production and social labor must not be understood in terms of the non-specialized labor of the manual worker, although this labor does have its function within the whole. It must be understood on the scale of humanity. Production is not trivial, labor must not be reduced to its most elementary form, but, on the contrary, thought of in accordance with its higher forms. 
Total labor then takes on its creative or poetic meaning. The creation that is pursued in the praxis through the sum of individual acts and existences, and throughout the whole development of history, is the creation of man by himself. The so-called history of the world is nothing other than, than the production of man through human labor. Within nature, this vast complex, the world of products or total instrument is interposed between man and nature. It is an object of nature, but turned towards man. Without this complex of tools and techniques, men are nothing. Yet the human cannot be the utilitarian or instrumental. Whenever men become instruments, whenever the ends of human activity are purely utilitarian, even though these may be disguised by the ideologies used to justify them, then man's condition becomes inhuman. Human beings come to think of themselves as the instruments of transcendental powers, of destinies or divinities. In order to resolve this contradiction between the instrumental existence of homo labor and human demands for freedom, some philosophers resort to a transcendency. Man will realize himself at a later date in another life or on a plane other than the terrestrial, that of mystical salvation. While he waits to be finally liberated, man obeys the destiny laid down for him by the transcendent power. Such doctrines restore even more cruelly the instrumental mentality they had set out to transcend. There is only one answer that has a positive significance. The activity that turns man into an instrument represents a contradiction within the human which can, which can and must be overcome. Instruments are not a form imposed on nature from outside, as abstract categories might be. They are not a prison for man, a rampart between him and nature. A tropical forest or a storm at sea are purely cosmic. The man who falls victim to such forces is powerless and isolated outside nature because he is the victim of nature. But a landscape that has been humanized, a house built in this landscape in an appropriate style, shows man in nature, having reconciled himself with it precisely by appropriating it. The highest consciousness is one of man and nature, of nature is different from man yet conditioning his existence. Man's higher consciousness therefore is not one of instruments or techniques, nor a pure consciousness of himself as a subjectivity external to nature. It expresses a natural life that has been humanized, organized and thereby intensified since, to, since in animals, Natural life is limited organically, reduced to elementary and, and incompatible tendencies, which vanish the moment they are satisfied. Industry is the real historical relation between nature, and hence also the natural sciences, and man. This is why, if we think of it as an exoteric unveiling of the essential forces of man, we can also understand the human essence of nature, or the natural essence of men. The natural sciences then renounce their abstract and material, or rather idealist, tendency. They become the basis of a science of man, just as, at the present time, they have already become, albeit in an alienated form, the basis of a truly human life. The idea of one basis for life and another for science is false. Nature, such as it becomes in human history, is the nature of man. In the course of his history, the human being becomes isolated in one sense from nature, yet in this way he contracts with it a more profound relationship and a higher unity. Man is a naturally limited being who behaves as a whole, who becomes an active subject, a spontaneous life, working to consolidate himself and raise himself up. Man, a finite being who opens up infinite possibilities for himself, is capable of raising himself to a higher degree of existence and looking and of looking down on the point from which he started. Man is a movement which is constantly turning back to its starting point in order to reassume it and raise it to an ever higher level, a being who contains his entire becoming within himself and gradually brings it under control. His limitation and abstraction are transformed into a source of power it is in fact the most limited thing about him. His abstract understanding, the ability to immobilize objects and instants, instruments and concepts in their separateness, 
which becomes the principle of this increasing power. Man's consciousness expresses his authority over things, but also his limitation, since it can be attained only by way of abstraction and logic, and in the consciousness of the theoretical man who is alien to nature. Consciousness expresses therefore both the finitude and infinitude of man. Herein lies his inner contradiction, which forces him constantly to deepen and transcend himself. Herein too lies his drama, his, for his misfortune, and also his greatness. From out of his limitation, man produces a determinate and human infinite, which envelopes and liberates and overcomes the indefinite given in natural existence. This infinite might be called the power of man, knowledge, action, love, mind, or quite simply, the human.